Ah, the difference our attitude makes. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day. Not satisfied with just a little empty religion in life, As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from folks who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Thanks for joining us. Well, we'll be thinking about attitudes today. We're in the midst of a series called His Eye is on the Sparrow, parts three and four today. Change your attitude and more lessons about attitudes. Our guests are Elizabeth herself. Later on, she'll read letters from listeners, including one from a stay-at-home mom. We'll be hearing about the Indians today. Rachel Johnson says that she grew up hearing the story of the sacrifice of the five missionaries and about Elizabeth's story. We'll hear more about that later. First, though, part three of our series, His Eye is on the Sparrow, as we think about the Indian people. Calm, quiet, dignified, somewhat mystifying people. Let's hear about them and their attitude toward life. Another outstanding characteristic of jungle Indians is how calm and quiet they can be. There was a difference in the three different tribes that I worked with. One was the Colorados of the Western jungle, and they were very, very hardworking, very savvy shrewd, intelligent Indians who had had a great deal of contact with white men for hundreds of years. And they had absolutely no desire to become like white men. It was very interesting because they were spectacularly painted Indians. The word Colorado, for those of you who know Spanish, of course you know it means red. And it was a very apt name because they painted themselves literally bright red from head to toe. And the men spent about a half hour every morning using a mixture of Vaseline, which they bought at the white man's drugstore, and this red dye called achiote, which used to be used in the States for the coloring of margarine. Some of you whiteheads here can remember the days when we used to buy a block of white margarine. It was illegal to color it, lest it be sold for butter. And there was this little package of either red powder or red paste that you had to mix with this white stuff to make it look like butter. Well, that came from the Colorado Indians of the western jungle of Ecuador. And they painted themselves, as I said, from head to toe with this. Then they smeared this stuff on their hair in such a way that they would bring it out like a, well, like a helmet. It looked like a steel helmet. They'd smear their head completely with bright red dye and Vaseline, and then they would work real hard to make it stick out in the front so it looked exactly like a steel helmet that they were wearing. Anyway, those people, with all their colorful differences between themselves and the white people, were very calm. They didn't talk much at all. And they carried themselves with great dignity. And there was a sort of a mystery about them. Of course, I was a brand new missionary. I wasn't engaged to Jim Elliott at that time. I was a single missionary working with two British women and an English and American woman. And I was completely mystified with their courtesy, their respect, and yet their mysterious silence. Then I worked with the Kichwas, and they spoke very, very quietly. And when my mother came to visit me, she said, I don't see how you hear these people. She said, you just mumble, too. You all just sit around here and mumble. When she told me that, I I realized that when I was speaking with the Indians, I spoke the way they did. I hadn't really given it any thought that they spoke so quietly that to my mother it was nothing but mumbling. And I was realizing that I was adapting myself to them. And one night, my girl that helped me with the dishes and things, she lived in, lived in the house, 16-year-old girl with a nine-year-old husband. It was a very interesting couple. And uh, they had been promised by their respective parents to each other when they were babies. And so I had this wonderful girl there, her name was Urgenia, and she had this cute little nine-year-old husband. (laughs) And uh, I warned Urgenia that some white folks were coming in for supper in the night. 
And so while they were doing the dishes, I came through the kitchen and she turned to me and she said, Senora, she says, what are you, what are you gringo, what are you French, as they called us, you Frenchmen, because apparently the Quechua word was a corruption of Frenchmen. I guess the first white people that ever went in there must have been Frenchmen. And she said, I said what, are you, what are you Frenchmen going to do all evening, sit there and shout at each other? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, that's all you ever do. She said, when foreigners come in here, you just yell at each other. <laughs> and I realized that we would talked about twice the volume, normally, as the Indians. But there was a calm about them. Now, the, the Alcas could get very loud, and Lars would testify to this at our visit in January. We sat around for hours and hours in the hammocks, and everybody talked at once, and they'd get talking louder and louder and louder, and everybody wanted to tell me all the stuff that had happened in the 30, what is it, 36 years since I had left there. Uh, they wanted to tell me who had died and who had been born and whose wife did this and that and the other thing. So they got louder and louder and louder, but then when they were talking among themselves, again, they would get very calm and very quiet. There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians 4.11 that my father one time used in speaking at the chapel service for a boys' school, high school boys. And I've thought about the fact that this would be a very unusual text for a man to use nowadays speaking to a bunch of high school boys. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Have you ever heard of any young person making it his ambition to lead a quiet life? That's not all it says. To mind your own business. Who would ever make that his ambition? And to work with your hands. We're all supposed to work with our brains now, aren't we? Nobody worth his salt is going to work with his hands anymore. If you have to work with your hands, it's just too bad you haven't got enough brains to get somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> but make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. It's a very simple formula for a peaceful heart. Calm. In that beautiful hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, there's a stanza that says, O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus met to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. That's one of my prayers. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from my soul the strain and stress. And Lord, please let my ordered life confess the beauty of thy peace. When St. Benedict founded his monastery, one of the rules was that all work was to be done without haste and without sloth. Stop and think a minute. Now, how do you do the work that you hate the most? Do you do it with haste, slapdash, just in order to get it over with? In a slapdash way, just because you hate the job and you want to get it over with? or? Are you so lazy that you do it slothfully? Both are wrong. Both will not bring peace in our lives. The Indians taught me that you can do things calmly. I, didn't, I never saw them hurry about anything except if they hear a wild herd of pigs going through the woods, which was a very rare occasion. And then everybody was electrified, and of course the men grabbed their spears and raced off through the forest. But normally, everything they did was just done in a very methodical and calm way. And I wanted to learn that lesson. Each of these has its application for you and me in just learning to live, learning to live in a way which doesn't stress us out. It just astounds me to hear a little kid say, oh, mom, I'm so stressed out. 
where do they get this? Well, you know where they get it. Number four is laughter. One thing the Indians were good at was laughter. I mean, they laughed at everything. And I was the object of <laughs> endless amusement. When I lived with the Alcas, I had to realize, I just simply had to settle for the fact that everything I did was freakish. Everything about me was freakish. I was a giant to them because I was head and shoulders taller than the tallest woman and a head taller than the tallest man. Pitiful color skin. They'd never seen anything quite so washed out. <laughs> and my hair, they said, looked like palm fiber. I was a blonde in those days. And my eyes looked like a jaguar's because they, they'd never seen anything human that had anything but black eyes. The only creature they knew with blue eyes was a jaguar. When I would wake up in the morning, there would be two pairs of black eyes looking down into my hammock from an observation platform which two teenage boys had built in the house next door. Now the house next door touched my house with the roof like this. There were no walls on any houses, of course. And so here would be these two pairs of black eyes looking down into the hammock, waiting for that stunning moment when these blue eyes would open. And they would then make an announcement to the entire clearing, bottled yangamamba, which means she's awake. And that stunning piece of news would be relayed all the way around the clearing, bato nyani mamba, bato nyani mamba, in case anybody missed it. She's awake, she's awake. So I would get up and out of my hammock, unwrap myself from the blanket, which was one of my freakish things that I did. They slept totally naked, of course, they lived totally naked. But I had to sleep in all my clothes, with a blanket, with the fire beside my hammock, otherwise I froze. And so I would take the blanket off, hang it up underneath my thatch roof, and take out of a rubber bag a small transistor transceiver radio, which had been built for me by the radio station in Quito. The HCJB crowd up there had made us this little transistor transceiver. And I would have to carry that across the clearing and attach it to an aerial on the far side of the clearing. And as I started across, as I took the radio out of its rubber bag, these two boys would make the second announcement, which was, <laughs> which means there she goes with that radio again. Uh, of course, they had made up the word for radio, apeninga, meant the talking thing, and there she goes, mm -hmm, is the way I was carrying it, you know. And as I walked across the clearing, every single step was accompanied by sound effects. <laughs> now try that on your next door neighbor. Stick your head out the kitchen window as he's walking to his garage or to his car and go, eh, 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 eh. I mean, you don't really know how to respond, do you? Do you keep in step or do you shift your gait? <laughs> Everything I did was amusement and so I had to just settle for affording them nonstop entertainment. His Eyes on the Sparrow Part 3 of an 11 part series. This was Change Your Attitude. We'll have more lessons about attitudes coming up First, though, Rachel Johnson, Creative Media Director for the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, talks about what she heard growing up about the story of Jim and Elizabeth. I don't remember the first time that I heard the story, but I know that it was a story that was talked about in our home. Um, my mom had read um, Elizabeth's books whenever I was younger, and so um, you know they would talk about Jim and Elizabeth Elliott, and they would talk about other heroes of the faith from that, you know, same time period or um, around, around that time. But I just remember thinking as a child when I did, you know, know about Elizabeth, just how incredible that was that she went back. Rachel Johnson of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation. Later on, Elizabeth will read uh, a few letters that she received. First, though, Let's get back to that subject of attitudes. Hey, as you think about life, what are your goals? Would leading a quiet life be part of that? Minding your own business? And think about a, a simple formula for a peaceful heart. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. 
Have you ever heard of any young person making it his ambition to lead a quiet life? That's not all it says. To mind your own business. Who would ever make that his ambition? And to work with your hands. We're all supposed to work with our brains now, aren't we? Nobody worth his salt is going to work with his hands anymore. And if you have to work with your hands, it's just too bad you haven't got enough brains to get somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> but make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. It's a very simple formula for a peaceful heart. Calm. When St. Benedict founded his monastery, one of the rules was that all work was to be done without haste and without sloth. Stop and think a minute. Now, how do you do the work that you hate the most? Do you do it with haste, slapdash, just in order to get it over with? Or are you so lazy that you do it slothfully? Both are wrong. Both will not bring peace in our lives. The Indians taught me that you can do things calmly. I, didn't, I never saw them hurry about anything except if they hear a wild herd of pigs going through the woods, which was a very rare occasion. Number four is laughter. One thing the Indians were good at was laughter. I mean, they laughed at everything. And I was the object of <laughs> endless amusement. When I lived with the Alcas, I had to realize I just simply had to settle for the fact that everything I did was freakish. Everything about me was freakish. I was a giant to them because I was head and shoulders taller than the tallest woman and a head taller than the tallest man. Pitiful color skin. They'd never seen anything quite so washed out. And my hair, they said, looked like palm fiber. I was a blonde in those days. And my eyes looked like a jaguar's, because they, they'd never seen anything human that had anything but black eyes. The only creature they knew with blue eyes was a jaguar. When I would wake up in the morning, there would be two pairs of black eyes looking down into my hammock from an observation platform, which two teenage boys had built in the house next door. Now, the house next door touched my house with the roof like this. There were no walls on any houses, of course. And so here would be these two pairs of black eyes looking down into the hammock, waiting for that stunning moment when these blue eyes would open. And they would then make an announcement to the entire clearing, which means she's awake. And that stunning piece of news would be relayed all the way around the clearing, in case anybody missed it. She's awake, she's awake. I would be on the trail. The Indians had fun putting me up at the front. They would be behind me. And suddenly I would go off onto an animal trail. And either they would just break up laughing. Look where she's going now. And I said, well, what am I doing? And they said, well, can't you tell an animal trail from a human trail? I said, no. Well, you know great deal was lacking up here. Everything I did was amusement, and so I had to just settle for affording them nonstop entertainment. <laughs> Number five, humility. Romans 12.3 says, don't cherish inflated ideas of your own importance. That's J.B. Phillips' translation. If you want the NIV, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But I like J.B. Phillips. It's much more colorful, and it certainly is a very accurate translation. Don't cherish inflated ideas of your own importance. We need to cut ourselves down to size, realize that the world is not waiting for whatever we have to offer. And he goes on, Paul goes on in this epistle to say, but have a sane estimate of your own capabilities in the light of the faith that God has given you. Don't cherish inflated ideas of your own importance, but have a sane estimate of your own capabilities. Now that means don't overestimate your capabilities and don't underestimate them. 
And don't go around with a Uriah Heap attitude, poor little me, you know, I didn't receive any of the gifts. I was behind the door when the gifts were given out. And so if I could only do what we just heard this man do when he sang so beautifully, or if I could get up there and speak or write books or play the piano or something, wouldn't that be wonderful? Don't cherish inflated ideas of your own importance and do not underestimate your own capabilities. Don't estimate them over what they were. Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. And Jesus said, come to me, you who are tired and overburdened, and I will give you rest. And Jesus is the only one who could ever say, I will give you rest. I could give you a place where you might find rest. I might create conditions of peace and comfort for you. But Jesus said, I will give you rest, but you have to come and you have to take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And if he, the Lord of the universe, the infinite majesty, learned what it means to be meek and humble in heart, who do we think we are? Cherishing inflated ideas of our own importance. And how many things in this world are really our business? That's been a wonderfully simplifying principle in my life. The Lord has been reminding me, there are not very many things in this world that are your business. Just a very few things. And you be faithful in those things, and let me handle the rest. Well, I got a wonderful letter from one of our radio listeners. I just can't tell you what a thrill and and how thankful I am for the, the mail that we do receive. So much of it is very sad, full of horror stories, such as we couldn't even imagine. Lars and I will often read the mail, and then we will say, that's the worst story we've ever heard. And I'm sure these folks over here who read the mail before I get around to it know exactly what I'm talking about. But then the next week, there's a story that puts the first one in the shade. But here's one of these wonderful ones. This woman says, I have listened and re-listened to your tapes, Love Accepts, for your insight to the ups and downs of marriage. It has helped me more than all my counseling and the books I have read. Last year, I finally threw my hands up and said, no more books of how-to. The Lord is going to be praised for our marriage, not any book or author. Your tape is not getting my praise either. It's the word you proclaimed in the tape. Submit, obey, become a servant, make yourself small, use the frustration in your marriage to draw you to God himself. Glory to God, that is the answer. I have learned and continue to learn. It takes my brokenness each step of the way. The Lord is breaking me. That is what is missing in the message I just listened to on a daily radio program and in 30 minutes, there was not one word spoken from the word. I'm beginning to have red flags over these programs that they are counterfeit Christianity. Am I overreacting? Or do you see this danger as well? I have started listening very closely to everything I hear on Christian radio. I hear how complicated and complex everything has become, and it tends toward the thought that there are not enough answers or solutions. That breeds hopelessness and a what's-the-use mentality. I believe that God made the answer simple. Even a child can understand it. You are always accused of being simplistic, and so am I. I say, you're right, she says. Well, to humble oneself, to start having a sane estimate of one's capability is a very simplifying thing to realize that a whole lot of things in this world are not my business. I thank God for the lessons that the Indians taught me. I wouldn't take anything for the years that I had with them. So here are five things, once again, endurance, acceptance, calm, laughter, and humility. May God give us grace to trust him to teach us these things and help us to obey. 
More Lessons About Attitudes, Part 4 in our 11-part series, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Well, before we go, we have time for Elizabeth to read letters from listeners, including one from a stay-at-home mom. This one from somebody named Denise in Pennsylvania. She said, although I have supported about five or six radio ministries, I have probably learned the most about one through Gateway to Joy. When I first listened to your ministry, I thought you were a little extreme. But day after day, you spoke on the marriage and mothering and duties of both. It took a long time. I won't admit to how long. But slowly I was convinced that you were right. But the biggest change came when I took seriously your idea of being a stay-at-home mom. I didn't believe it possible. Women didn't do that today. This was the 90s, after all. I'm sending a copy of the letter I put in our church newsletter on my answered prayer as I reread it. It strikes me funny how we try to solve our own problems. I'm so glad God is a whole lot smarter than I am. Elizabeth, you are partly responsible for me being a stay-at-home mom today. I used to start work at 3 p.m. till 11.30, Monday through Friday. I would get into the car at 2.30. Your radio program here is at 2.15. My hours were changed to 2.30 p.m. to 11.30. Now I had to get in the car at 2 o'clock. I hated the change, but I know now it was to get me to listen to your show. I'm convinced of it. God uses everyday things to change our lives. He used your program to help change mine. It's been about 10 weeks since I quit the Postal Service. My husband and I both worked there. We worked opposite shifts, so we were home with our two boys, ages 9 and 4. Our salary is now cut in half. I love it. I am here in the morning, here after school, here to read books, have devotions and supper, baths, bedtime, all things that I had missed on a regular basis. I am very thankful. It was a bold move in today's eyes. But I'm glad we did it. We all need to trust God more than we do. I'm learning this daily. And I found this one very interesting from a 17-year-old boy named Joshua. He says, I'm sending you a copy of my book report on your book, Passion and Purity, on the advice of my mother. She thinks you would like to read it, I've read Passion and Purity, Mark of a Man, Let Me Be a Woman, and Part of Shadow of the Almighty. Let me put in a parenthesis that Shadow of the Almighty is the story of the life of Jim Elliot, my first husband. And I've had more young men tell me that that book has shaped their lives more than any other book. Jim Elliot was a man of God, but he died at the age of 28. So this young man, Joshua, goes on to say, they offer so much insight and guidance for a person my age, and I'm sure for all other ages as well. I'm concerned for so many teens out there in the world because of the influence they are under. Well, so am I, Joshua. I'm glad that you're concerned. Well, let us hear from you, and if you get a chance, leave a review. Well, as our time together comes to an end, thanks for letting us come along with you as you maybe got some exercise, or maybe you were at home or at the office. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. Easy to remember, elizabethelliot.org. Elizabeth with an S, by the way. More talks, devotionals, videos, and more. Until next time, may God remind you daily, you are loved with an everlasting love. What's underneath? And underneath are those everlasting arms.